Greetings and salutations, beautiful beans. And thank you so much for joining us today for a very special interview, may I say, with Laura. How are you doing, Laura? Hello, I am so excited to be here. It's going to be great. Exciting. Where are you calling in from today? I am in Indiana in the US. Indiana, beautiful. Yes. I was there. Well, not this time of year, but oh. we do have our we do have our moments. Yes. <laughs> I was there in 2019 for Gen Con. No, that's Indianapolis. No, that's not yes. the same place at all. That is the same place. No, yeah, I'm in Indianapolis. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. We, we, we keep we Indianapolis in Indiana for convenience. So, that is yeah. very helpful. Unlike the yeah. Washington tobacco where I'm like, right. there's two of them and I don't know which one I'm talking about. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get sidetracked by the confusing nature of American geography, <laughs> may I say you stole all of our place names. I don't know how that happened, obviously. It's okay, um, though, because we mispronounce every one of them. Yes. There we go. <laughs> And speaking of pronunciation, let me please introduce Laura van Arendonk Barr, who writes fantasy of many flavors as well as nonfiction. In the past month alone, she released a la the last novel in the epic fantasy tetralogy. That's four, right? Yes. Tetra, I know, I know my, my Latin. <laughs> and short, uh, signed a short story to Kevin J. Anderson's anthology. Kevin, uh, sorry, Laura enjoys travel, fair trade chocolate, and making her imaginary friends fight one another for her own amusement. You can find more of her award-winning work at lauravab.com. And I've been reliably informed that you also have a Twitch channel. Tell us a bit more about what you do there. I do, I do. So uh, it's a weekly stream and we just talk about topics that have to do with the business of creativity. So it might, yeah, yeah, it might be like, hey, this is how I'm setting goals for productivity, or this is, uh, you know, nobody becomes a writer because they like spreadsheets and accounting, but unfortunately those things have to happen. So yeah. Absolutely. Shy Red Fox in the chat says, it's a great weekly stream. I am absolutely certain. And uh, I've just dropped that link in the chat. So you can find Laura over at Laura Van Arendonk Bar author on Twitch for a weekly, weekly stream. Uh, it's weekly, Tuesday. Weekly stream. Tuesday stream on the business of creativity. I love I, that. I think it should be Laura underscore VAB on Twitch, I think. But yeah, there we go. Awesome. Don't, yeah. Awesome. I, 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 yeah. Okay, amazing. So uh, you can find Laura on Twitch. You can find Laura on YouTube. You can find Laura on her website. Well, I think it's time to get to the meat of this conversation. And oh my, what a juicy one it is. We are talking, of course, query letters. So for those of them, uh, uh, those of our audience who aren't familiar with a query letter beyond the obvious, what are we talking about today, Laura? The, the query letter, um, the, the fun way that I would say it is it is the nice shirt and tie that your story wears for its job interview. Uh, so it is, it is just there to, you know, it's not going to sell the story. The story is going to sell the story, but the query letter is there so that when you walk into the interview room, they don't look up and go, oh dear God, no. You know, they're like, oh, this will go, this will go well. Okay. You know, so, so that's the, that's the purpose of a query letter is just to introduce your story to the editor or agent or wherever you're sending it. Absolutely. And there is, um, there's definitely an art to these things, aren't there? Yeah. And, 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 and let me just, emphasize again, the query letter does not sell your story. Like don't, if, if you spent a week agonizing on your query letter and four hours revising your story, this is not the best use of your resources. Okay. <laughs> like you can, you, query letters are not as scary as they feel. They feel really terrifying. I, yeah. I get that, <laughs> but that's why I have a system for them. Um, but honestly work really hard on your story. The query letter is just the nice shirt that it wears. Fantastic. So that actually um, brings me to my first question. Is it like, what stage should your manuscript or your short story or whatever you are querying, and when we're talking querying, usually we're writing either to agents or to editors. Mm -hmm. uh, what stage should the piece of work be at when you're sending this query letter? In almost all cases, if you're watching this stream, your work should probably be finished and finished and revised and ready to go. Um, the two exceptions to that are for nonfiction, you might do, it's not called a query letter in that case, it's called a book proposal, but I can say, hey, you know, this, I, I'm considering writing this nonfiction, would, would, there, would you have a market for that? Um, but that's not going to be true for fiction. In fiction, if you are Stephen King, <laughs> you know, John Patterson, you know, one of these names, um, Stephen King can, can 
phone up somebody and say, I'm thinking of writing a new thriller. It will be 85,000 words and I'll have it done in July. Do you want it? Um, so he doesn't have to have it done before he does a query. If your name's not Stephen King, we're going to be finishing our manuscripts before we do our queries. <laughs> I like that as a general rule. And if you are sitting in, a, in the chat and thinking my name is almost Stephen King, well, <laughs> get polishing beans. <laughs> so what we're talking about here, of course, is you've written your first draft. You uh, may have done more than one draft before you share it with somebody else, although I would always recommend sharing with an alpha reader fairly early in the process. They will spot things that you have not seen. It's nothing yes. against you. You've only got one set of eyes. Yes. Um, You'll have revised and revised and given it to beta readers. You'll have done developmental edits where you shift the story around and change characters. You'll have done line edits where you make sure that your prose is exactly what it should be all the way through the book, especially at the beginning. Beginning is especially important. Yes. Um, and at this point, you've polished, you've shared it with people, you've got feedback, you've polished again. Now, I think, is when the query letter starts, right? I want it as good as I can make it. Yeah. It will probably go through another round of edits again before it hits publication because that's how this works. Uh, but I want as shiny as I can polish it before it goes out. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I think that's something really important. A lot of people start, they, um, they put the cart before the horse. They start thinking about the query letter before the book is done. Mm -hmm. um, and your query letter, as, as Laura said, like it's, it's your book presented as beautifully as you can. So if your book changes, then your query letter will also change, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so um, great, we figured out what you need before you start your query letter, which is a thing, a book, a short story, something. How do you figure out where you're supposed to be sending these query letters or to whom? So, uh, so how much time do we have on this stream? Um, there are a lot of, <laughs> there are a lot of ways to do this and, um, and you'll probably find what, what groove you're happy to settle in with time. Um, so actually where I pick up most of my query targets, you know, the markets that I'm thinking about submitting to at this point, it's largely word of mouth and social media. So, um, you know, somebody in one of my writers groups will say, oh, did you see such and such magazine with a focus on sci-fi and horror is uh, accepting calls for submission in March. And so people who are writing that sort of thing can go click over and see what the sub subs are. Um, I frequently will, you know, catch stuff and then I'll post them in, you know, hey guys, um, you know, there's a fantasy set call for subs that's open and I'll share those. Um, many times the publishers are putting this stuff out on social media. Um, I follow some editors who will put up, you know, hey, in the next 18 months, these are going to be the calls we will be opening. So that you can also do things and um, hold on, hold on. What's it called? I'm going to check one second. <laughs> check my notes. The grinder, <laughs> the grinder, the grinder at dot diabolicalplots.com uh, is a great just uh, database of markets. So you can put in, I have a historical fiction story and it's 4,000 words and I am interested in these pay scales and it will give back to you a list of markets. That's so uh, that's a really useful tool as well. Yeah. Now I know that you tend to sell your short fiction to, uh, to collections and, and editors, and you tend to self-publish your longer fiction. Yes. If somebody were interested in selling a novel, in, in working to traditionally publish their novel, where could they start to look for agents? Where would that process begin? Uh, so there are, there are two routes. If yeah. you have the option to go to a conference and talk to agents there, that's honestly my favorite way to do it, but that's me personally. I'm also yeah. like, a weird writer who comes out of my basement at least once a week and that sort of thing. So <laughs> a lot of us are, are not face people, right? Um, but I think it's so much easier to, to get a relationship going if you're having a conversation and agents go to conferences specifically to meet writers. So that is what they are there for. Um, if that's not the case, then you can start um, browsing around for, you know, uh, literary agencies all have websites that say these are our 12 agents. These are, this agent is looking for historical fiction. This agent is looking for queer sci-fi. This agent is looking for whatever, and you can pick and choose. It is really important to make sure that you're choosing agents who are actively looking for what you have, uh, because you know if they've already got a stable of 30 epic fantasies and I send mine in, they're going to be like, hey, it doesn't matter how much I like it. I've already got a stable of 30, yeah. right? So, um, so that's a waste of your time and theirs. So um, 
but honestly, agents um, and editors are actually quite good about using social media and their websites to advertise what they're looking for. So, you know, politely stalk them and <laughs> find out what the what's out there that that they are uh, that they are actively looking for. And um, you'll frequently see go by on Twitter um, a manuscript wish list. Like, man, I wish somebody had a story about a reality show child actor who grew up to be a serial killer. Cool, I just wrote that. Let me send that to you, right? You know, I didn't just write that, but I might now. But um, <laughs> but that's the uh, um, that's the thing is you can see that those kind of things go by and you say, well, I don't have that exactly, but this is close. Can I query yeah. you with this? Fantastic. So looking for manuscript wish lists, finding agents, finding what agents specifically are looking for, um, agents who are accepting is the other thing. Um, and uh, yeah, really just using using your Google Foo and your social media skills if you want to do it online and otherwise going to conferences. And one tip I've heard a lot, and I haven't done this myself, so I'm totally just passing along unvetted advice here. But one tip that I've heard is if there's um, an agent who's your absolute dream agent, like this is, um, you know, the the big name agent and but that big name agent might get 4000 queries a week. So, you know, but that big name agent works at a literary agency where there is another agent who is less known. So you can target the same agency who's gonna have access to many of the same resources. Interesting. Um, and so you can you can go and browse and see if there's a junior agent who might be willing to take you on. Fantastic. That's a really, really good tip. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you have figured out all the people that you want to send your query letter to. And I'm assuming you shouldn't just send one query letter to one person and assume that that's it. In fact, I'm going to strongly recommend that you do not query all of them at once. Uh, there's, there, there's, uh, there's a process here. And the reason for that is if I, let's say I have 20 agents that I'm going to, I'm going to query and I send my query out to all 20 of them. And the first five responses I get back are, wow, this is a good concept, but it really needs more world building. <laughs> okay. And I go, oh, I can easily go back and add more world building, but I have just burned bridges with all 20 of my things, right? So send out three, take that feedback, send out three, take that feedback. And you're not going to apply every feedback. Of course you're not. But if you're getting a pattern, probably something you should look at. And, um, and so that gives, you, that gives you a chance to make adjustments and then tweak what's going out rather than, well, I guess I'll start with a new project. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a that's a, a fantastic piece of advice. And uh, we're definitely going to get more back to that on sort of how you keep track of things and everything else. Um, so we've talked about what you need ready. We've talked about who these things might be going to and how you compile that list. How do you prepare and construct a query letter? Because that's, of course, the big question, like what how, how do you put this thing together? So I actually have saved on, you know, in my, in my business folder, my bare bones uh, formula query letter, which then I tweak every time I pull it out to use. Yeah. Um, but my system is, I have three paragraphs that go into a query letter. The first paragraph introduces my story, which for me is, as, as you mentioned earlier, that's generally going to be a short story. So I can say, you know, this is the title of my story. It is this genre. It is this length and it is being presented for this anthology or, you know, whatever the case might be. And, and I'm going to put just, just enough hook in there. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's about a uh, Greek girl who gets abducted and tells Greek mythology to Norse gods to entertain them. Okay. So that, that's, that's my first paragraph. And you're not trying to give a synopsis or anything like that. It's just, you know, if there's a list of stories, they can go, oh yeah, that one. Okay. You know, on the desk. The second paragraph is where I will say why I was a good person to, uh, uh, to, to write this. This might be really specific. It might be really general. So like um, one of my critique partners writes uh, World War II th spy thrillers and where, you know, but he lived in the area of France where they're set. So he can get that local angle. Right. Mm. Um, or I can say, Hey, I, you know, spent a semester studying in Spain, studying this period of history where this historical novel is set or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, that doesn't have to be super academic. It can also be, 
I am an absolute nerd about this subject. I have been involved in this hobby for 25 years and that's why I'm best equipped to write about cosplay murders or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do that. Uh, so two just basically gives it, paragraph two just basically gives it the personal touch of, this is why you want to read my take on this. There's lots yeah. of these out there, but this is why you want to read mine. Um, and paragraph three is optional. Paragraph three is where I put publishing credits um, and so if you don't have a lot of publishing credits, don't make something up, just don't put that paragraph in. Um, but if you have publishing credits, uh, this mostly is here. Honestly, I, the way I think of it is I'm just saying, hey, not my first rodeo. I positively will get you my edits on time. I will answer my email. It just shows that I'm a reliable person. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to be, you don't have to put in bestseller credits to be considered. This does not sell your story. Your story sells your, sells your story. This is just yeah. a reassurance that I'm a reliable employee who's going to show up for work. So, absolutely. Where do you stand on things like adding your author platform? For example, would you say I have X number of followers on YouTube and X number of followers on Twitter? For example, is that something that you would include? You could do that. Um, if, if I did that, I'd do it in paragraph three, and I, I probably would only do it if it's really impressive. Yeah. Um, what? The, the truth is that social media follows don't actually translate into book sales. Um, it's a, you know, it's a nice metric to throw around, but it doesn't mean that much in most cases. Um, so if you have a publisher who has specifically said in their guidelines, you know, tell us the number of Twitter follows you have, then go ahead and follow the guidelines. Um, I have never mentioned my platform in a query letter uh, because honestly, I don't think most people care. They, they care if you're engaged, they don't necessarily care what the numbers are. Yeah, if that makes fair sense. enough. So we've talked about what should be in there. And just to recap that, that's number one, this is my story. It's juicy. Number two is, this is why I'm the best person to tell the story because I have this experience or this training, or I'm really, really excited about this and I've been doing it for 20 years or whatever. Number three is where you talk about your writing credits. You might mention a platform if you have particularly impressive numbers, but generally it's, these are my author credits. I have been published. Would you mention if this is your, if this is not your first novel, for example? Yeah, no, if you have any publishing credits are going to be good, just make sure they're real. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell this story vaguely. Uh, somebody um, submitted their story to a contest, which is great. Do that. But then in their publishing credits listed, my story is under consideration for this prize. Well, everything that was entered was under consideration. So yes, technically, but also that just feels a little scammy. I don't know. Yeah, disingenuous. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, so you, and and guys, it's not worth fudging over. Okay. Just if you have, you know, um, and, and it could even, you know, even be like I had this short story that was published in this webzine or you know, whatever. That's a publishing credit. Just be honest about it. It's fine. You know, don't don't feel like you have to puff it up more than it really needs to be. Um, one of my really good friends um, just sold her first stuff last year, and her query letter included zero publishing credits because it was her first thing. Again, your story sells your story. Just put the put them in the query letter if it's applicable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so we've talked about what should be in there. Should your query letter for the same manuscript be different for different people? Possibly, very possibly, um, because ideally I have looked at my market well enough to know, you know, market A tends toward harder sci-fi, market B tends toward space opera. And I have a story that rides right on the line. I actually write, write neither, but just for the fun of it, <laughs> right? It's sitting right in that line. And I might emphasize a little bit I've been published in these big hard hard sci-fi markets, or I hang out on this space opera forum, or you know whatever, just to kind of guide that conversation one way or another. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess also it would be different if the agents have different requests on their query guidelines. Yeah, well, I mean, if that's you've got, the other thing, right? Yeah, if you've got an agent who's who has said. I would love to see some portal fantasy and I would love to see and another one who said, I'd love to see some time, time slip. And again, your story sits right in the middle. Just introduce them. One is a portal fantasy and one is a time slip fantasy and just yeah. let it go from there. Right. Um, you know, again, don't for the, for the love of everything, do not lie about, you know, Oh, my epic fantasy is actually a hard sci-fi space opera 
yeah. fly fishing romance. Like, no, just don't do that. <laughs> okay. Like, um, you know, be honest about what it is because, um, because you don't want to set someone, it's, it's not going to accidentally sell your story. What it is, is you, they're going to go in with a set of expectations, get hit real hard and quit sooner. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's, that's a great piece of advice. Um, so we've talked about what you should include. Um, what shouldn't you include? What should you not put in there? And I'm sure you've seen some howlers. I know, um, some of you know, I used to be in the music world. Um, and uh, occasionally when I was uh, like on the other side of the, the panel and, and looking at auditions rather than, than, than giving them, it was uh, very interesting to see what people included in their, in their CVs and cover letters. I, I will say that it's, it's gotten better, I think, now that everything is done electronically or with email or with, with submittables. Um, a, and a friend of mine, and I don't mind telling this story because she told it on herself on social media the other day, but uh, in the days of quick paper queries and she included a glamour shot and all these little extra bits to, you know, to throw in, to unpackage with her manuscript and all this stuff. And fortunately that's less common these days. Um, but things that I, that I actually do still hear um, from editor friends and things frequently, um, who we already mentioned, you know, don't artificially inflate your publishing credits. If you, if, you know, th there's not a need to, it just don't set yourself up to, to look a little fudgy yeah, you know, for no good reason. Um, another one would be uh, get the editor's name right. Like the number of times that that happens, and yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I I never even imagined that one. I, oh my gosh. I talked to um, a friend of mine who's an, you know, Ed, we, you know, we've been we've been working together um, for uh, oh, gosh, I don't know, eight years or something now, and um, she told me all the time she has a very feminine presenting name, but all the time she gets letters to Mister her name. And, oh, you know, because people are just doing pay, copy and paste, they're not actually reviewing, or um, she'll get things they say to de dear sir, she has never been a sir, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, and it's just one of Something those to pay people, attention to don't, right, don't it's such a low bar, <laughs> right? It's such a low bar <laughs> to get that first line accurate. Um, so don't tank yourself, you know, going in uh, right there. Um, the the other uh the other thing i would say is and I, I don't know if this is a don't include but it's definitely a review before sending um submission guidelines really do matter and there are standards but occasionally there will be you know deviations from what you might think of as the way i usually do it um and they're not doing that just to yank your chain like so you know if they're if they're saying please send this in this typeface or whatever. Um, that's an editor who looks at 3,500 queries a week and he really doesn't want to strain his eyes. And so this is what he's done, you know? And um, so, and sometimes I think, sometimes I think that the, the submission guidelines, there's a little bit of the brown M&M clause going in there. If you have a huge, you know, pool that is, you're constantly, your slush pile is constantly huge. It, it just helps you to filter out the people who are going to be better to work with. Yeah. So be one of the people who's better to work with. <laughs> yes. It's, it's again, it's so easy. It's such a low bar. Attention um, to detail is important for an author. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, like you can still go online. I don't understand how it's in, in 2022. Now I can still go online and find a, how to submit a packet, a query packet, with information solidly from 1981 in there. <laughs> so wow. you know, make sure. So what, kind of things... out, what, what is outdated? Flat, flag for us what is outdated in case we um, find one of these things. Including your social security number, which in the US is our you know personal ID number. Yeah, right. um, including that in your query. Don't do that, all right? Like it probably was not a great idea in 1978. It is definitely not a great idea today. Um, and the, the idea behind that is that then, you know, you're, you're payment gets taken care of properly. They'll work that out when you sign the contract. Don't put that in your query letter. Okay. Um, physical mailing addresses, usually not necessary. If you see something that's telling you that you have to include it, probably vet, you know, what other information is in that recommendation yeah. as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, all, all the queries that we do now are by email or with an online form such as submittable or mashup, uh, you know, some of those. So yeah. Amazing. 
Amazing. That is a, a freaking gold mine of information there, Laura. Thank you so much. So we've talked about what you shouldn't include. I will also add, uh, this is something we saw a lot in the music world. I love music so much and I've been singing since I was a little girl and I really love singing and it makes me really happy. Uh, everybody who's writing books feels that way about writing books. Everybody who's singing feels that way about singing. It, it is it is not necessarily going to help you um, if you add something like, it's my dream of publishing and I always wanted to publish a book. And now I'm so excited that I've finished my novel and here it is. Um, Try Notice not to... that in my three paragraphs, there was no fourth paragraph of I want to feel warm and fuzzy, right? Like that's yes. not, <laughs> yeah. There's, Try and there's keep the system. sentimentality out of it because right. remember these people are, are reading form. They're trying to get the good stuff as quickly as possible. And the more fluff you put in there, the harder it is for them to find the hard tack information that they will latch onto and say, holy crap, this sounds like a great story. Send me something. And as cold and heartless and mercenary as it sounds, publishing is capitalism. And nobody is going to pick up my story to make me feel warm and fuzzy inside. They're going to pick up this, my story because it will work for them in their market, right? So really, really angle, like what you were saying earlier about targeting your query letter for a specific market, really, really aim for how will this story be good for you? Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up with, with another do not include, don't miss this opportunity to publish the next JK Rowling. Like, no, sorry, don't do that. <laughs> don't. Oh, no. Yes, yes, that yeah. actually happens too. Let's not. Um, don't be that guy. And um, so, don't be yeah, that guy, um, people. again, just you know, present this in a very professional manner. This is, and again, thinking of it as a CV is a great way to do it. You know, this is what I have to offer. This is exactly what it is. This is the niche that it fills. This is why mine is a good one to go with. And here's, you know, proof that I can deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say folks, if you're sitting there and thinking, oh, I don't have something finished yet, don't worry. This is something you can take notes on and use again in the future. Uh, VO Day will be here for 14 days, of course. But um, if you haven't finished your manuscript in 14 days, and you know what, we've all got a lot on work right now, then uh, start thinking about how you can use this this information in the future, because it is it is really important that you get this right. It it is your first impression of of what you have. It's the business card of your story, almost. So I'm going to say something that sounds terrifying, and it yeah shouldn't necessarily, but it will definitely sound terrifying in the beginning. Um, I recently submitted to an anthology and they had 20 spots open for stories mm -hmm. and they received 1500 submissions. Wow. If you are an editor with a stack of 1500 subs, okay, to get through, you're, I don't care how much you love literature, you're looking for a reason to sort fast. Yeah, you're trying okay? to trying to pare things down. Right. You need to get you need to make those first decisions very, very quickly. And if I pull it out and the first thing says, dear sir, and I'm not a sir, you've made my decision easy, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's again, your story will sell your story, but your query letter is all about, hey, I can provide you a good story and I am an easy person to work with. Yeah, so. absolutely. I will not make your life hard. Right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. So we've we've already talked a little bit about the most common mistakes in query letters. Are there any others that you'd like to, to flag there? We've talked about people including things they shouldn't include. Right. Um, now, I think that's enough horror stories for the moment. We may circle back later, but <laughs> yeah. I guess formatting is a big one. Um, oh, right, right. And, and Again, going back, if you find something, you know, the, the, another sign that you're looking at older recommendations, you know, I'll say courier or do another monospaced font. Those were really important in the days when everything was being physically laid out by hand. That's yeah. not why we're doing it this this week. So, um, but but do send it in something more like Times New Roman and less like Comic Sans, unless it specifically asks for Comic Sans. Okay, so um, if yeah. they ask for Comic Sans, step away. <laughs> Yeah. Or I will say that some people, and, and I have an allergic reaction to Comic Sans, but I'm told that it is good for certain types of dyslexia or something. But Papyrus, if you send it in Papyrus, that's on you. Okay. Like right, right out. Yeah. Okay. Or, or go full chaotic. Just, just use wingdings. Oh okay. God. Yeah. Or, or all capsing or underlining or yeah, just, just. Yeah. Again, like heavy think formatting. professional of the, thoughts. No yeah. emojis. No yeah. emojis. That's a yes, great reminder. Yes. No emojis. <laughs> Again, it's not that we think that you might do these things, but it's easy to make a mistake and it only takes one thing.
for the editor to go, mm, maybe not, and pick up the next one. So, right. eh. <laughs> All right, and just, just so that we're not just sitting here going, oh, don't be those people. Let me tell the yeah. story where I was those people. Um, so <laughs> how you're done. We're going to talk, um, you know, we mentioned earlier, like managing and tracking your submissions and, um, and, and I do that. I really do. I swear, but I made a mistake in my data entry and I wrote down the wrong market, which is how I resent it. The same story that had just been rejected to that editor again. Oops. And so I got a lovely email back saying, thank you, but this looks substantially the same as when I rejected it two weeks ago, which was and then I had to change my name and move to another country and I can never go out in public again and all of these things. And, um, you know, so mistakes do happen and, uh, you know, it's, it's not, it's probably not as bad as it feels, but I'm not over that yet. But, but I'm just saying that, um, you know, there, there are, but there's such an easy list of things to check. You know, did I do the editor's name correctly? Did I include the right name of the story that I attached to this, you know, all of, you know, just, just, Give, give yourselves that one more check time and it's fine. Yeah, absolutely. And actually yeah. attaching things, that brings up an interesting question. Um, your query letter, what goes with it? So if for a short story, the short story, the end. Um, for a novel, you're going to want to check the submission guidelines. And yes. this is going to yeah, yeah. read the whole guidelines. Don't just send out packages um, because uh, different people like to receive different things at different stages. So one might ask for the first five chapters. One might ask for the first chapter and a synopsis. Yeah. One might ask for the first two chapters and a short synopsis and a long synopsis. You know, you're, read the guidelines, find out what people want, send them exactly what they want. Yeah. Any tips on writing synopses? Because I've done this before and it's hard. Nobody likes synopses. Like nope. synopses takes, are the it's worst. It's like your book minus the joy and the art. Well, it is totally like, like the if if I could summarize the story in two pages, I would not have spent one hundred and thirty thousand words on it. Right? Okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, so one way to do synopses, and and if you just go out on the internet and Google how to do synopses and get past all the sobbing and crying and huddling with dark chocolate and down to the pragmatic parts. Um, what I have done is just gone through and pulled like, here's a sentence from each chapter. Mm -hmm. And then I'll combine those into something slightly less hideous. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, if, if you just sit down and you're like, let me tell you what happens in my story. And then 20 minutes later, you're still talking. We've all been there. Right? Yeah. And that's, you can't make a synopsis out of that. So you want to pare it down, pare it down so far that it feels like it's gone too far. And then you're about right. And now you can polish that. Absolutely. And it's, it's really about plot beats and the most critical character moments if they're a plot beat and look at because i mentioned earlier short synopsis and long synopsis i mean sometimes people will want it in one page i wrote a hundred and eighty thousand word book how do i put that in a page okay but that might be a thing or you might have a synopsis that's five ten or twenty pages okay 20 yeah. is getting pretty long you don't see those very often but um but again just look and see what they're asking for and give them what they're asking for yeah. And it's worth mentioning that, you know, agents know, they do understand that by asking you to boil down your massive fantasy novel into a single page, you are gutting your story. You are gutting the characters. It is story minus art minus joy. They understand but that's that. Why but they, they have chapters too. Exactly. And they <laughs> yes. want to know just, they want to know exactly what's happening. They want to know that you have a good understanding of how the plot hangs together that the end is good, that the beginning makes sense, that it all works. That's what they want to know. That's what they're checking with the synopsis is, is this, does this book make sense? And then they want to check that you can write by reading your chapters. And keep in mind that agents actually do want to find books to represent. <laughs> okay. yeah. Editors want to find books to buy. So they, they are trying to give you, you know, they're, they're not just going in, I, I'm here to destroy literature as we know it, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, maybe could have dimed, timed that better. But, it. Um, it. Uh, but, you know, but that's the thing is they've got your chapters one through three or whatever it is, and then they've got your synopsis. And if they read your cold, dead, rotting skeleton of a synopsis, but then they look over in your chapters for one through three, you know, the synopsis fleshes out really nicely. They're going to assume that the rest of it will flesh out really nicely too and ask for a full or something. Absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. And that is the, that's what you want, right? So I've got a few, a few questions here. Um, 
this is a silly one. Should your query letter always be the same regardless of the project you're hoping to publish? Well, I think we've put that to bed already. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. Uh, can you query several people at the same agency? So usually not, I think, right? Yeah. Usually yeah, that's I, sort of frowned upon. I have heard of this. Again, this is this is not me. This is things that I have heard of an agent saying, this is not right for me, but have you considered so-and-so at this agency? Yeah. Okay, she's open to. Um, and so if you get something like that, by the way, personal referrals, they don't they don't get paid to make personal referrals. Take that for yeah. that's a win. What it's worth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but with if, if you're talking just, I'm just going to cold query for people at the same agency, I don't think so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can you query an agent again if the manuscript has been rejected before? If they told you the first time, I would like to see this again with these revisions. Again, take that exactly for face value. They don't have to tell you that. If they reject it, you know, this is not for me. Or whatever, um, then I would probably believe that at face value too. It's not going to yeah. change because I added another character or something. Absolutely. So unless you do some kind of massive overhaul, then probably yeah. like change the book basically. And the other thing you kind of just want to keep in mind, I mean, thinking from their perspective, um, they're, you know, they've, they've read 400 you know, queries between that one and this one, but they did read this one. And if they're reading yours and they're like, this sounds really familiar, they may or may not remember that they, that they rejected this before, but they're going to think it sounds derivative and repetitive, which is not the best way to represent yourself. Yeah, so. absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, should you query every agent on your list at once? No, no, I think we, we talked about that this. already. Yeah. 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 So give what yourself are the, some recovery time. <laughs> I was going to say, time. what are the benefits of staggering? Um, partly it's they'll, they'll give you feedback, right? Hopefully. Yeah. And, and, and here's what I would say, you know, cause there's so many kinds of success here, right? Um, there is the form rejection and form rejections. Like it's normal. It happens. You know, we eat the chocolate, we move on with our life. Give there's me a TLDR. The, give me an example of a form rejection. What does that look like? Thank you for the submission. It is not for me. I wish you all the best. Signed me, the agent. Okay. okay. So it's not personal. It's it's not hateful. It's just thanks. I'm not taking this. Okay. Um, a personal rejection is something where they have customized that rejection to you. Uh, thanks for letting me see this. It's not for me. I really liked the characterization, but I felt like the world building was too thin. You know. And, okay. Okay. That gives me something to work with. Um, Here's the thing. Remember what I said about, you know, and I have, I am not making up numbers when I say some agents might get thousands of queries a week, right? Like if they take the time to write you a personal rejection, that is a win because that is time out of their day that they did not have to do. So um, as cold and heartless as it sounds, that's a good rejection. <laughs> okay. But it, it really is. Okay. So, um, so sometimes you will take uh, and, and how do, how do I want to say this? One person's opinion is one person's opinion, but if you're seeing a trend, you, you want to take that into account. And I did get a rejection on, you know, we felt the world building was too lean. And that's a story that I changed absolutely nothing on and has gotten so many positive, I can't believe this world building reviews. So, you know, you hit one person on the right day, right? Like that, that's, it's just how that is. Um, so if I get, if I send out three or four queries and I get two or three back that are personal rejections that mention I should pump up the world building. I'm not gonna send any more till I go back and revisit my world building, okay? Now, if I get one that mentions that and you know the others don't, then it's a judgment call that I have to make. But, but yeah, so, you know, so sending them out staggering means that I'm not build it, burning all those bridges at once. I'm giving myself time to learn from those rejections and make a better product. Does that make sense? I think, I hope that makes sense. No, that absolutely makes sense, Laura. And um, again, there are many types of many types of success that aren't a direct success. And I guess if you're getting exclusively form rejections, you may want to look at changing both your story and your query letter. Because it may be that there's there's a mismatch there or, or mm -hmm. just your work needs a little bit more polishing or maybe this isn't what people are looking for right now, I guess.
Yeah. And, and again, there's, there's so many reasons that rejections will happen to really good work. You know, I, I mentioned earlier this, the, the collection, the anthology that had 20 spaces open and received 1500 submissions. There are going to be a lot of really good things that don't get picked up because there's just not physically room for them in that book. Right. Um, uh, someone I knew, uh, got a rejection back. That was a, you know, Hey, your, your, your story is good but it's in this particular niche subgenre. We only do so many of those a year and we already have that filled and she sold it later to someone else, right? Like stuff happens. Um, don't assume that rejection means your product is not marketable. It means it wasn't marketable that day in that particular spot. Absolutely. And again, you mentioned earlier, it may be that yes, okay, this author, rep- this uh, agent represents a bunch of epic fantasy authors, but they have enough of those. And so, yes, right. okay, you you thought you did the right thing going to somebody who works well with epic fantasy authors, but they've got their quota and they don't need another one. Right, exactly. Are there other reasons that a good query letter might be unsuccessful? So even if you did a great job with your manuscript, you did a great job with your query letter, are there other things that... Um... The editor's cat died that morning. I mean, st- you know, sometimes people have bad days, right? Yeah. And um, and you you can get you know, you've got someone who's not in the right receptive mood to take that, or your story was amazing. Your story was awesome, but it dealt with, you know, grieving the loss of a parent and they just went through that and they can't face yeah. that story right now, you know, yeah, yeah. like any really number of things. Bad match for some reason. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, if what I would say is don't ever look at a single rejection, look at trends. You know, if my story has been rejected, rejected 23 times, okay, I'm going to start looking at what's going on there. If my story has been rejected twice, Twice is not even a statistically valid number yet. It's fine. (laughs) Move on. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of, um, what kind of numbers would you be looking at to see? So if you saw something three times, four times, would that be when you would, when you started to pick up on something? Some of that is going to depend a little bit on genre and market. So if I'm sending to very large markets, um, you know, the, the really big science fiction and fantasy magazines, the, the, the big publishers, those kinds of things, um, I'm going to get a lot of rejections just because the law of large numbers, you know, the statistics are not going to, you know, 1500 submissions, there's 20 places, you know, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, If I'm sending a lot to smaller presses or to uh, literary agents who are not, you know, the, the, the really big names, those kind of things. um, Again, a few, a few rejections is completely normal and expected. uh, But I, if if I'm getting into double digits, I'm going to start looking at, what can I tweak? What can I revise? Yeah, so. absolutely. And actually, that uh, brings me nicely to my last question, which is how do you keep track of all of this stuff? I use a spreadsheet, which works great as long as I put the correct name of the market into the spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, that, that one time, we just don't discuss that one time. But Didn't um, happen. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. It wasn't even to me, actually. It was a friend of mine named yeah, Mara. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally. So, totally. No picks. Right. Didn't happen. Yeah, but I, I, I just use a, a spreadsheet. So I've just got an Excel sheet that with all of that, um, things I keep at minimum, you're going to want the story title where you sent it. And, you know, did you get a response yet? Yes or no. Yeah. Um, I also will track um, the, you know, the day that I sent the, re- or that I got the response. So I know how long it was out. So I know what is usual for that market. Um, if, if they send me a, uh, there's a thing called shortlisting. So we're gonna, we're, we're collecting stories for this anthology. We got 900 submissions. We've narrowed it down to 200. Yours made the shortlist. We'll make our final decision in two months. Those kind of things. So I mark if that story has been shortlisted. Um, I also will track on there, uh, when does their exclusivity expire? When do I get rights back? That sort of thing. So then I know if I can resell that story or sell it uh, in something that I'm doing or something like that. Um, and so I've, I've just got that all in one place. I don't have to like go thumbing through contracts to find that stuff. Yeah. Um, How so do you track it, feedback? Oh, that just goes into notes. I've just got a column labeled notes. Um, and it says things like accidentally resent to the same editor, you know. <laughs> Stop beating yourself uh, up about that. Come on, you're fine. I'm not over that. I, I don't even know how many years ago that was, but I'm still not over that. It's going to um, happen to a main character. You're going to go through some writing therapy and you're going to be okay. Exactly, exactly. How are we wrong? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, but no, I will put, um, I have a column that's just notes and that's where I will, uh, you know, throw in anything that's particularly unusual there. Like, um, like, oh, we had, we had a email miscommunication, wrong address or something, but we caught up here or something just, you know, in case I'm wondering later, I'm like, why is this one look so different than the others? Oh, that's what was going on. So. Okay, fantastic. So it sounds like you've got a great system there. That's absolutely awesome. Uh, anything else, any other data that you track there? Um, well, that's, that's my list of data. I, I will say I, I know people who track that by hand in a notebook. If you're a very tactile notebooky person, go for that. Um, I don't like trying to keep track of my notebooks. So that's why in a digital form that I can find anywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, there are online services, like if you're using um, you know, the grinder or things that, that will re remember where you sit. And I'm going to recommend, please always have your own copy because don't rely on somebody else to keep track of your valuable data for you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's great if those exist, but make sure you're keep tracking everything yourself at home. How do you um, track revisions of stories? Because if you sent something out three times and you revised it, how do you, how do you keep track of that? So for me, I don't actually do like version numbers or anything like that. I, I know there are people who do, and that is, that, that's where my brain just goes, nope, nope, that sounds too engineering for me. I'm done. I'm out. Um, so for me, it's a stories before this date were uh, version A, and then stories after the state is where I change the ending or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but if you need to get more granular with that, oh my gosh, Excel will do whatever you want to do for that. So let it, let it go do its thing. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, I have asked all of my questions, but you guys have asked some excellent questions as well. So let's have a look. Great point made by Shy Red Fox here. Did you cover that agents often close their inboxes for a few months after NaNoWriMo? Can you tell us a bit more about that and why? Uh, yeah, so NaNoWriMo is the sit down and just crash through, you know, get 50,000 words in a month. And unfortunately, there is a perception gap between I have written the words and I have revised a finished novel. <laughs> um, cool. And I, um, I have heard, I mean, I've had people tell me, yeah, it's, it's November 29th and I've already sent my novel out. And I was like, oh, probably not gonna work out that great. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, and it's because there is such a flood of, you know, unpolished, unrevised first drafts that goes out and people have learned it's just better to not accept than to try to filter that. Uh, so make sure when you send your stuff out, it is as pretty and shiny and lovely as you can get it. Um, because they might be working through a stack of the, oh, it's January. Now I can send it. And, and you and you want yours to be the gleaming, the gleaming gemstone in the slush pile of unrevised first drafts. Yeah, absolutely. A really, really good point there. Uh, Lady Grish has a question. How long should we wait for a response to a query? And oh. What if you don't get any response at all? That's a really excellent question. Thanks for asking that. So generally speaking, submission guidelines will tell you our response time is typically 30 days, six months, you know, whatever. Um, and it, what I would say that my personal rough rule of thumb is if, it, if that time, response time comes and goes, I will give them another four weeks and then do a polite follow-up. Because okay, um, yeah. stuff happens, you know, email gets lost, you know, uh, somebody got sick and was out of the office, you know, whatever. Uh, but don't don't email them. Your, your response time expired 12 minutes ago. Where's my stuff? You know, like <laughs> that does not fall into the category of I'm easy to work with. OK, so, um, uh, you know, I my rough rule of thumb is I give them approximately four weeks, then follow up. That said, I am seeing a growing trend by growing trend. I mean, I think I've seen it three times so far, but that's a lot for me of if you don't hear back, the answer is no. And I don't like that. I think that mm. feels very unprofessional and I'm not super keen on markets that do that. Um, but again, that should be in the submission guidelines. I saw one this week that said that, but it was in their submission guidelines. And I'm like, okay, at least they're upfront about it. Um, if, yeah, if they don't say that, then send the polite follow-up. And if they don't respond to your follow-up, then you probably didn't want to work with them anyway. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. And uh, that sounds like something that you should add into your spreadsheet if you are if you are querying someone that says uh, no news is bad news, then uh, yeah, write then a note that so that you don't stress yourself out. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's have a look here. Some excellent questions. Oh, Far actually, realms. Oh, tell me. Oh, I'm sorry. I just no thought friend. of something that kind of follows up on that. Yeah. Um, you will see in some submission guidelines 
uh, simultaneous submissions are okay or are not okay. And that means, you know, if I'm submitting to market A and market B, if I query them both at once, that's a simultaneous submission. If they say it's okay, do that. If they don't say it's okay, don't do that. Because if market A and market B are both considering your story and market A sends you a contract, then you have to contact market B and say, hey, you know that thing you were about to give me a contract for? The answer is I'm taking it back. Is not the way to make friends, yeah. especially if you have a you know, distinctive three word name in the industry, don't, you know, don't, 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 don't get yourself on a blacklist. You know, okay. Editors talk, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's worth mentioning. You never know who knows who, right. Um, it's amazing or how people many move around all the time, yeah. you know, I've people been watching editors and... flow from house to house, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And again, the other thing is that people will chat as well. So if they see, oh, you previously had such and such an agent, or you previously published with such and such a person, people will ask each other questions, you know, oh, I know someone at that, at that agency, I'll, I'll ring up and see what they were like to work with or whatever, you know, yeah. it's, um, you can never be sure they won't is all I also, will say. I'm not saying they will, but you can never be sure that they won't. So agents and editors polite. are on Twitter too. So if yeah. you go on Twitter and just lamb blast, oh, I can't believe this isn't it. Like, oh my God, don't get, yeah. they might remember that when they're looking at your query, you know, just be a professional civilized person. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Rem remember that this is a professional business and uh, as much fun as writing is, the minute that you're querying professionally for publication, this is this is job. So job yes. face, game face, yeah. job face. Yeah. Uh, Far Realms Gaming asks, how are word count requirements rigid and set in stone? Is my 1200 page epic fantasy novel doomed to keep me in the slush pile of agent rejections? Okay, so this is a multi-part answer. Um, yeah. the, the shorter the form, the more rigid the thing. So if you are doing flash fiction and they say a thousand words, then 2,500 words is not going to be, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, you're not going to do it. Now, if you're doing epic fantasy and they say 100,000 words, 100 to 5 is going to be okay, right? Yeah. So, um, so part of it is know your market. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you're going to go over word count or be significantly varied from word count over or under, uh, be very, very good. Uh, if, you, if you're going to ask them to make an exception, you'd better be amazing. Yeah. Uh, and if you are less established, you need to be within the guidelines. So again, um, you know, we have a, a hard call at 60 K, um, Stephen King can fudge. <laughs> the, the, the person who this is going to be their debut novel needs to be at 60K. Yeah, um, and the absolutely. other thing I will point out too is all of, uh, all of that happening in the industry, um, it's all going to be by word count, not by pages. Absolutely. So uh, just getting the, get used to saying, oh, you know, I've got a 60,000 word cozy mystery or you know, whatever it is, um, because that's how people are going to want to hear it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I would say... Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, I think a few years ago I was looking into this and it was saying in general, even in epic fantasy, they expect first novels to be in general standalone and in general a little bit leaner. So if you look at something like Brandon Sanderson's Elantris, yes, it's epic fantasy. It's not a small book, but, you know, it's not it's not the size of his later books. It's not the size of Mistborn and it is standalone. So that yes. was the general wisdom a few years ago, at least. Yeah. And what I... What I keep hearing is um, I'm going to pitch, I'm going to query or pitch a standalone with series potential. Yeah. So if it does well, we can expand it, but it needs to stand alone because um, if you don't have a, you know, a really good publishing history, you know, they're taking a risk, you know, it's a yeah. financial risk to take a new person on and they're going to minimize that risk as much as they can. And one book is less of a commitment than a seven book series. So, Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. the fans will be really sad if they get buy into something that has hooks, enough hooks for seven books and they don't get to read it. So right. they're, it's damage control as well, in a way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because the alternative is, oh, we just won't publish it. And then there would be outcry. I'm not going to name a very famous uh, trilogy that has only two books in it, but um, I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. All right, Amanda Alp has a wonderful name and asks, I'm thinking of submitting to literary journals. Is that a good way to get found? 
submitting short fiction is actually a pretty good way to get found. Uh, it used to be like the primary track that everybody did. It's not the one way anymore, but it's still a pretty good way. Um, I have personally gotten uh, offered work from editors or publishers who saw other work of mine they liked. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a good, good way to do that. Um, I'm gonna say that my, my experience is in genre fiction, not in literary fiction. So we'll put a little asterisk there of your mileage may vary, but it's still a, um, it's, it's a much, it's a much more entry level friendly way to do it. Because again, the financial commitment for somebody to buy a short story is different than a financial commitment for somebody to buy a full manuscript. So. Absolutely. So Bonnie Juju has a great question here that I'm sure a lot of people have been wondering. We talked earlier about the three paragraph formula for a query letter. Paragraph one, this is my story. It's this long. This is the title. It's like this. This is what it's about. Paragraph two, this is why I am the great person to tell this story because it's about ancient Greece and I've loved ancient Greece since a child and my degree is in ancient Greece or I've read every single book published about Greek mythology or whatever. What if you don't have any special qualifications other than the love of the genre for paragraph two. What can you put in your second paragraph to explain why you are the best person for that book? So I would say two things. Um, one, if there truly is nothing, then just skip that paragraph. Boom, doesn't happen. Again, your query yeah. letter doesn't, it's, it's just an introduction, that's all it is. So if it's short, great, they can get to your story faster. Two, before assuming there is literally nothing to put down in there, go talk to some other writing friends or people who don't know you write, but know you nerd about Greek mythology or whatever, and, um, and ask them, do I have anything that would make me sound like I'm really smart in this area? And they're like, oh, well, yeah, you know, you've, you've won the trivia contest for, you know, Greek gods every, every way. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll put that in. And it's okay. Like, there's a lot of my query letter stuff that goes in that has a little bit of levity to it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, you don't have to try not to sound pompous. <laughs> so you, it's okay to yeah. say that, you know, I, um, I, I have been a fan of this genre forever, a, you know, since, since this, you know, landstone like mile marker piece or whatever. And, um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm saying this very, very well, but the point is like, you might have credibility, credibility that you're not thinking of. And if you truly don't, just don't worry about it. Fantastic. Fantastic. So just skip that paragraph. You can put words elsewhere. Don't say anything that's not true. And I love the idea, ask your friends, because it's very hard to talk about yourself. It's very hard to be like, I am the foremost, blah, 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 of whatever it is. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Your friends will think of things that you don't necessarily think of. That's a really good one. Well, our final question is really two questions. The one is, how can we find out about conferences? And the other is, how can we find people to read our stuff and give us feedback? But since it's about finding things and finding yeah. people, I no, feel like- can just... actually go together. <laughs> Um, my critique group that has been running since 2012, which makes it like a century old in critique group years, but we all met up and formed our critique group at a conference. So those things oh, can actually amazing. quite go together. Um, honestly, the easiest way to do it is just Google writing conference, your geographic location and, um, you know, and just, and just start there and then start asking for, uh, for recommendations from other people in you know, the writing community, um, yeah. browse around on the discord or something. The great thing that came out of 2020, there was one, <laughs> one of them was uh, writing conferences went online. And so now you can attend things that, uh, that you couldn't, you know, for geographic reasons before. Uh, 20 books to 50K they had a conference every year in Vegas and they put all of their content up for free on YouTube. So there's amazing resources out there now. Um, now, if you're attending virtually, um, you may not have the access to the agents or you might have virtual pitches with agents rather than face-to-face -face pitches with agents. But as far as networking, and which is a conferences are a great place to network. Um, alternately, the internet is full of writing community resources and just go and look for, hey, I'm writing epic fantasy. Is there a community of epic fantasy writers? And then, um, and just kind of match to, you know, some things are much more, um, and I, and I say this with absolutely zero shade. Some communities are very professional, like we are all about growing as fast as possible. Some communities are very hobby writer, you know, 
all of those are valid. It's just that if you're trying to be one in a group that's primarily the other, it's not going to feel good for you, right? So Absolutely. try to get one that matches uh, matches where you are. But um, but yeah, that's the, we. This is a great time to find resources because uh, so much stuff is online and virtual now. Yeah, absolutely. And Necromancer Tris in the chat mentions libraries also do a lot of smaller writing clubs and workshops if you can't afford a whole convention, the travel yes. or the expense, because some of them can be a little bit pricey. So you can also do meetups with authors and publishers there too. So check absolutely. out your local library. You may be surprised. Yes. And, and honestly, there are quite a lot of things that are the conferences that have gone very cheap or free online. Like I said, 20 books is all, is all their content is free on YouTube right now. Like um, I did another conference um, recently that was free to attend. The whole thing was on Discord. Like you do have uh, low cost options out there. Yeah, absolutely. Lucary says there are also decent writing subreddits that you can check out. So um, lots and lots of options there. Well, we are wrapping up now, getting to the end of our time. Laura, any final words on the query letter process? Any final wisdom you'd like to give to our beans? The query letter is the cute little hat you put on your really amazing manuscript. Make the manuscript amazing and it will do the heavy lifting. Your query letters just say, hey, have you met my friend manuscript? So that's it. I absolutely adore that. Well, um, yeah, I would say don't be afraid. Jump in, be bold, be brave. You can do it. Polish your manuscripts and uh, yeah, share it with the world. They will love it. You will find the person that loves your story. That's what it's all about. Guys, um, thank you all so very much for being here today. Of course, a massive thank you, Laura, for being here. You wonderful bean. Oh, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. And uh, you've given us so much good advice, so much food for thought, I think, here. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get you back on another time to do some more of this because, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I would like to wish you all a very happy time zone. And I would like to ask you to grab your hammer and go world build. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>